Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome. So my name is Shiro Armstrong. I'm the director of the Australia Japan Research Center here at the ANU. Uh, before, I, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the traditional custodians of this beautiful Ngunnawal country uh, and the land we meet on, and pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people and their elders past and present. Uh, so it's a real pleasure for me to welcome everybody uh, and open this update uh, here with my colleagues, uh, Ipe Fujiwala and Llewellyn Hughes. Uh, we co-convene this update. And this Japan update is the 10th year um, so uh, this was launched 10 years ago by, oh, thank you. <laughs> That's right, it's nice to celebrate the milestones. Uh, and launched by Fujiwara Ippe and Veronica Taylor. Uh, so this year we have sessions on the economy, on economic security, uh, a new-ish topic that I think um, we're all thinking about, of course, foreign policy and security and science and technology. Uh, so we've brought um, some top academics, people from industry from Japan, of course, and those close to the policy process. In Kaizuka-san's case, someone right in the middle of the policy action. So as we do each year, uh, it's a pleasure to launch the East Asia Forum quarterly issue um, related to Japan. This year, we focus on ASEAN and Japan. Uh, this is, of course, leading up to the special 50th anniversary summit in December, where Japan hosts the ASEAN leaders. And Oba Mie, who's here today, has a piece in here, of course, and her piece was featured in the Financial Review on Monday. So I hope you saw that. And if you didn't, please check it out in the magazine. Uh, we did this focused on the ASEAN relationship because it's important for Japan, it's important for Australia, uh, and we'll hear more about that during the day. Of course, today, President Jokowi in Indonesia is hosting Prime Minister Kishida in the ASEAN Plus Three Summit, um, and tomorrow uh, that's broadened out to the East Asia Summit grouping. This comes on the heels of Japan, of course, inviting ASEAN to join the G7 Summit, which Japan successfully hosted in Hiroshima last May. It's been a big year for Japan in foreign policy and security affairs, and we'll hear much more about that uh, during the day. Uh, some of that discussion will include Japan having passed laws to double defense spending in the next five years, uh, and Japan having put in place economic security measures to help navigate great power strategic competition in the region. Australia and Japan continue to grow closely, um, cl closer strategically. This is the closest the two countries have ever been. Um, that's across people to people and travel, travel having resumed, but the economic and energy relationship, of course, uh, and uh, now uh, a big new feature of the relationship, the security relationship. But there were some diplomatic fumbles or grumbles in the energy relationship after Australia's gas policies earlier this year. Uh, and that, of course, reminds us that we can't afford to take each other for granted and for the relationship to run on autopilot. So hopefully we can talk about those issues in the later panel. Japan's economy, of course, is growing strongly right now, 6% growth year on year. Prices are rising in Japan, um, quite remarkable, and it's a weak yen. So if anyone hasn't been to Japan recently, it's a great time to travel there. <laughs> uh, but before we move on to the update, I wanted to update everybody on uh, some of our uh, events here and what we've been working on, but also, importantly, uh, about our friends and colleagues here at the ANU. Um, and to start, I want to, to say that our thoughts are very much with our dear friend and colleague, uh, Ricky Kirsten, who is battling cancer right now. Uh, Ricky's an important member of the Japan Studies community at the ANU, but in Australia more broadly, uh, having led ANU's Asian Studies efforts in the past. Uh, and of course, she won't be a stranger to this audience, having spoken at the update uh, many times. Um, she's returned from a leadership position at Murdoch University a few years ago to the ANU. Um, and, and again, our thoughts uh, are really with Ricky. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, sadly, Carol Hayes passed away last year in October, uh, and she's sorely missed by our community. Um, we're very pleased uh, in that regard in recognition of her huge contributions to Japan studies, 
Japanese studies, the Japanese government will award her a posthumous Order of the Rising Sun gold rays with rosette. So we acknowledge again today the big leadership role that Ricky and Carol have played in building our, our work here at the ANU on Japan and on Asian studies more broadly. Let me highlight some of that work that um, they've been party in building up uh, and led the leadership, uh, led the building up of. Um, so alongside, of course, our courses on the Japanese, uh, on Japanese language and literature, still the la largest language program at the ANU, we have courses on the Japanese economy, Japanese politics, Japanese foreign and security policy, and a masterclass on Japanese policy issues. And of course, Japan plays significantly in many of our courses across the college. We're seeing many more Japanese students on campus now with a twinning program with Ritsumeikan University. We've got an internship program with Keio University economic students and our exchange students in both directions have resumed uh, and very active um, post-COVID. Uh, you probably already know, but pleased to know if you don't, we have more student exchange arrangements with Japan at the ANU than with any other country. Uh, and in, in addition to our individual research um, from colleagues um, across the college on Japan, uh, we have an active seminar series. We host a number of visiting scholars from Japan and some of those are in the audience today. And we've just signed an MOU with the Japan Research Institute to have regular visitors to the ANU uh, for joint research projects. Uh, and of course, we have our annual events in Japan so I realize the ANU is not the easiest place to navigate, um, but we do have a, a newsletter from the AJRC and the Japan Institute, so please sign up to those. Uh, I want to thank all our speakers for traveling here from Japan and elsewhere, uh, and thank you to the audience who's shown up in, in great numbers in person uh, and online, so we have a large online audience. Um, and at this event, I want to particularly encourage um, uh, and extend the opportunity to students to ask questions throughout the, the day. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, I look forward to all the discussion. And let me now introduce Professor Fujiwara Ippe from Keio and ANU to start the first session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's start the first session. Uh, it is our great pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Masaki Kaizuka, uh, the current executive director of the Bank of Japan, as a keynote speaker of the Japan Update 2023. Uh, Mr. Kaizuka has a tremendous career in policy making, having worked for the Ministry of Finance for 35 years. Before becoming the executive director of the Bank of Japan, he was the executive director representing the Japan at the International Monetary Fund. As you may know, the Japanese economy showed some sign of the change. For the first time in a three decades, we may be able to have inflation. <laughs> okay, so inflation is the positive word for Japan. Yeah, so that I started working at the Bank of Japan in 1993. Around that time, I learned Central Bank is an institution to fight against inflation. But the, during my 18 years career of the Bank of Japan, I have never seen any inflation. So that this time, we may be able to have a stable inflation or not is a very interesting topic. So I very much looking forward to listening to the view by Mr. Kaizuka on the current issue. So first, we will have a keynote address by Mr. Kaizuka, which is followed by a presentation and a discussion by Professor Rune Makibi, my colleague at the ANU. Uh, she had significant achievement in academic studies, publishing uh, many, many articles in uh, top academic journals, and uh, is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. And uh, also, Rune has been making a significant contribution to policy. Uh, she is one of the three authors of the recent uh, review of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Then after Rune's presentation, we're going to have a we would like to have a questions and the comments from floors as well as the voucher participants. We would like, as Shiro mentioned, we would like to have a library discussions among all of us. Okay, that's the format of the today. So without a further ado, please join me welcoming uh, Mr. Kaizuka as a keynote speaker of the Japan Update.
Uh, thank you, Ippei san. Uh, just immediately after your substantial introduction, I don't have anything to add, so <laughs> I can finish my presentation right now. But uh, as I allocate uh, 30 minutes to speak, uh, I, I should speak 30 minutes. So anyway, uh, Shiro-san and Ippei-san, thank you very much for your uh, very kind invitation to this uh, fabulous place uh, in the uh, campus of uh, ANU. And I'm very impressed to look at, uh, it's already gone, uh, the banner. Uh, there it says, uh, Australian Japan Research Center, uh, ANU Japan Institute. So Japan, Japan. Uh, when I have a chance to, to go abroad, go to United States for the, the uh, uh, overseas study back in 1986, there are many equivalent institutions um, or center in the United States, US, Japan, Japan, blah, blah, blah. And so many uh, the institutes which devoted uh, to the study on Japanese uh, economy, Japanese uh, the policy, Japanese uh, culture. But after the, the three decades of, uh, uh, after the last three decades, Quite an uh, uh, unfortunate thing is to see the change of the name of those institutions from Japan, blah, 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 to East Asian, blah, 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 or China, blah, blah, blah. So I'm still very, very much interested, uh, impressed with the uh, name of Japan still here on the banner. Thank you, Ken, thank you so much. Um, let me uh, start with uh, why I, I'm here. Uh, I got the uh, direct invitation from uh, uh, Ip Ippe Fujiwara-san uh, when we traveled together to Korea. And uh, we owed him quite much. Uh, I, in charge of uh, Institute of uh, Monetary and Economic Study in the Bank of Japan, we are occasionally organize an international conference. And uh, uh, when we uh, uh, have some difficulty to find a proper speaker, proper discussion, proper presenter who is fluent in English and who has a very substantive thing to, to, uh, to convey, uh, we always ask Fujiwara-san to join us. So when I uh, yeah, offer this invitation, I don't have an, an uh, alternative to accept this. <laughs> so this is the reason why I'm here. So if I, uh, you are not happy with my presentation, it's an uh, attribute to Fujiwara-san. <laughs> OK, then uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, Actually, this is not my first time in Canberra. My last time in Canberra was back in 2006 or 7, uh, when I was working for the Ministry of Finance and then engaging in the bilateral uh, trade negotiation with Australia. So uh, I repeatedly visited the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs building to have a very, very heated uh, negotiation and discussion. And uh, yesterday I came here, and uh, all the way from the airport to this place, I found uh, the quite uh, shiny new buildings building here. Uh, this is very surprising. My first impression when I first visited here, uh, we can see the open sky, no high buildings. And that impressed me. But now I can see the, some change, change here in, in Canberra. And, but uh, at the coffee uh, shop, uh, cafeteria, I found a very, very familiar name of a uh, flat white. Actually, I still don't know why it is called a flat white. <laughs> But anyway, that flat white, uh, this is the uh, long-lasting culture here. It's never changed here. So I'm very, very, very much impressed. Then, OK, let me turn to the uh, substance uh, of uh, my presentation. My slide, please. Oh. OK, um, as, uh, I'm, uh, as uh, Ippe-san uh, introduced me, I'm going to talk on the Japanese economy and, and prices, and I think I have a 30 minutes to talk. And uh, I subtitled my uh, the presentation, is this time different? So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, whether it is uh, this time different or it is not different, as, as it remains the same. Uh, let me, uh, this is the outline of my today's presentation. So first, I start with the general trend of a Japanese economy. 
uh, which is a little bit boring part. And then the highlight of uh, my presentation, the price, uh, price and the wage dynamism, uh, which is currently the showing up. Uh, I may skip uh, the uh, international comparison of the prices. And uh, le then lastly, I'm going to touch very, very briefly on the, uh, our uh, new initiative of a broad perspective review. OK, let me start the uh, Japanese economy. Uh, let me start with the, uh, our uh, current the Japanese economy and our outlook, the BOJ outlook. The left-hand side shows the, the, uh, our latest outlook of the Japanese economy uh, in terms of real GDP growth. Uh, this is, uh, came out uh, end of July, so the uh, situation is uh, very changeable. We may have a totally different number when we uh, next time uh, formulate the, the, uh, our outlook in October. But anyway, this is the latest figure. Latest figure indicate uh, uh, this current, uh, fiscal year. Our fiscal year starting in April and end uh, March next year. So FY 2023 means uh, uh, from April 2023 to March 2024. So FI23, we uh, estimate a 1.3% uh, 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 real GDP growth, then 1.2 and uh, in uh, FI24, then 1.0 FI25. So 1.3 outlook is backed by the, uh, some positive uh, the, uh, development of the economy. Uh, we have a materialization of a pent up demand, which was accumulated in the pandemic uh, period of time. And uh, we have a very accommodative financial uh, situation, and we have a series of uh, the, the uh, uh, government uh, policy packages. So all in all, we, we can have a very positive number of 1.3%. 1.3% uh, the uh, growth is a very substantial one from our perspective, because uh, uh, we are estimating our uh, potential growth is around the, uh, between 0 and 0.5%. Uh, area. So 1.3% is a relatively high number uh, here. I don't think a 1.3 increase is not the high number here in Australia. But anyway, for us, it is a, a relatively high figure. And, uh, more, and another promising sign is a very current uh, actual uh, the, uh, GDP growth. Um, on a quarterly basis, we issue the quarterly uh, the estimate by the government. And the very latest figure, which came out uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, indicate a six zero percent annualized uh, rate of uh, okay here six point zero percent mainly led by the uh, net export but still the number is very high so maybe in October when we uh, recalculate the uh, out, out, outlook for the FY twenty three the uh, number uh, is going to be uh, slightly uh, uh, device upward. Uh, it may be. Uh, I, I'm not, I cannot say anything for sure. So uh, the economy at this moment of time is a rather favorable situation. But there is a certain risk, uh, the, uh, mainly two risks. One is, uh, as uh, the, uh, Professor Fujiwara mentioned, we uh, finally have a sign of inflation uh, in my country. This is around the three percent so comparatively speaking, it's not a very huge inflation, but still, uh, for us, it's an inflation. And it may have uh, some negative impact on the consumption uh, ahead of a time. And uh, another uh, risk factor is uh, from overseas economies. US and, uh, uh, US and Europe, uh, looking at uh, the uh, policy rates on the uh, right-hand side, uh, they are facing the inflation, very high figure in figure, 9%, 10% uh, increase of uh, uh, consumer price. They, they uh, respondingly, they, they are tightening their monetary policies. For the U.S., they uh, raised the uh, 500 basis point already, and uh, there are more to come. Uh, I don't know once or twice, but anyway, there are more to come. And the European side, they have a 400 basis point increase, and they, there are also uh, some more to, to come. Uh, so th those uh, uh, policy, uh, the uh, tightening of monetary uh, policy may have uh, some negative impact on the economy. And uh, uh, people now are discussing uh, U.S. is going to be successfully uh, to, to, to have a soft landing of the economy. But uh, we have to be very, very cautiously to, 
to see what is going to happen to the U.S. European economy. And to the contrary, looking at the China, uh, here uh, they are uh, taking accommodative monetary policy. They are uh, they are uh, they are reducing the, their policy rate because looking at the the, the inflation uh, rate uh, uh, or Oh, this is wrong. I'm sorry. This one is a growth rate. This one is an inflation rate. I, it's a misspelled. So looking at this, China has a, the, a negative figure for the, the price increase. So people are now discussing China is going to, is a, or, or is already in a deflation. And somebody say it's a kind of a Japanization of the China economy. But uh, uh, it's uh, too early to, to judge. But anyway, there is a, some kind of uh, adjustment in the uh, real uh, estate sector. And uh, for example, use unemployment rate is scarcely high in 20% or something. So we have to be carefully, careful to see what's going to happen in the China economy uh, ahead of time. So uh, let me uh, turn to the Japanese economy. Uh, looking at the corporate sector, uh, the uh, corporate profit is uh, increasing trend on an increasing trend uh, because, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the economy is uh, recovering, and also uh, there is uh, some uh, uh, change on the setting the selling price. They are successfully uh, the, the raise the selling prices, and some, for some of the exporting uh, the uh, company, devaluation of the currency is uh, is a good one for the, their profit. So prof profit is on a rising trend. And uh, reflecting that, business uh, fixed in investment, that is a capex, uh, plan to be a relatively high number. So last fiscal year, that's ended end up with a 7.6% 7 7 .6 of increase of uh, business investment uh, last uh, fiscal year. And then uh, this fiscal year, uh, firms uh, plan to have a, a relatively high uh, investment plan, which uh, amounting to 12.3%, uh, which is uh, much higher than the previous years. So we have uh, some positive sign on, on the, the investment side, uh, which reflect the, uh, some kind of uh, the new uh, the investment, which was uh, contained in the period of, of the pandemic, and then there is uh, some deferred uh, the emergence of uh, investment, uh, one thing. And uh, secondly, we have uh, the, 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 uh, facing uh, the serious labor shortage. So uh, the company is engaging in the uh, labor saving uh, investment. Uh, and also, there is a kind of a long-standing agenda like uh, decarbonization or digital transformation. So the, the uh, company uh, will make a huge investment in those uh, growth area. So the, all in all, we have uh, the, the positive sign on the investment too. Let me turn to the uh, uh, individual side, the household consumption. Uh, the, uh, looking at the uh, left-hand side, uh, our consumption is still below the pre-COVID uh, the, the, uh, uh, time here. This one is uh, less than here. So, but uh, in, uh, the uh, promising sign is, is uh, oh, oh it's gone. It is now increasing. And uh, uh, one positive sign, uh, there is uh, two positive uh, the, uh, factors be, uh, behind the consumption rise. One is the, uh, we have uh, accumulated saving, we call it excessive saving. Uh, what it means, uh, in the pandemic uh, uh, the period of time, uh, people uh, restrain their consumption behavior because they cannot go outside, because they cannot uh, the, the, uh, go to the restaurant. So consumption was uh, contained uh, to a uh, much extent. And uh, at the same time, there is a huge transfer from the government to the individuals. And uh, because of a huge transfer and the contained consumption behavior, we have a kind of excessive saving in the hand of individuals. Now amounting to the 44 trillion yen, which is uh, around 8% of the GDP. 
So it is a very similar case uh, in the other country. For example, U.S. also has excess saving. But what is different is uh, after the COVID, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, excess savings now be uh, withdrawn and uh, turning to the consumption. So it is going to, to uh, decline uh, the accelerator. But in the Japanese side, uh, we are still have a 44 trillion yen uh, to be used for, for the future consumption. And another, uh, that indicate uh, here, okay, here, uh, propensity to consume is increasing. So that means that we are finally start to, to consume. And then another, another good, uh, good sign is the uh, income, employee income. Uh, that's uh, the black line indicate a rising trend of uh, uh, the employee income. Uh, I'm going to talk about the wage uh, later. Uh, but anyway, the uh, wage is increasing and the in uh, so income is increasing. Looking at the, this uh, diagram, white part is uh, the contribution of the total cash earnings. The blue part is uh, a contribution of the number of employees. So uh, the, the, in the past, number of employees increase is uh, a huge contributor to the, the, the rise in the income. But now, the, uh, the driver is turned to the cash earnings. So there is a huge increase in the wage, uh, which is very, very uh, promising. And, uh, uh, but uh, the uh, dotted line, indicate the, I have some problem with using this. Oh, anyway, so dotted line indicate the real income. We have uh, some inflation. So even though the nominal income increasing, the, the, the uh, real income is uh, uh, declining, but now hit the bottom and now uh, in, start to, to increase. So in, in, the, uh, the, in, in a few months or years time, we may have uh, uh, positive real income uh, we, we hope to have. So those uh, income increase have uh, some of the, the uh, positive uh, uh, influence to the, the consumption, uh, uh, the uh, behavior uh, of a household. But here is, uh, again, the risk factor. That's uh, inflation. If uh, inflation is uh, uh, certain, uh, over a certain degree, which may have uh, some uh, negative impact of uh, consumption. So we have to look very, very carefully what is going to happen to the price and the, consu uh, the uh, consumption uh, the, the, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the coming, uh, coming weeks and the months. So uh, let me then turn to the uh, highlight of the, my, my presentation, price and wage dynamisms. Uh, uh, finally, I'm happy to, to speak on this after the, the uh, 30 years of time. <laughs> so here, I heard uh, inflation is a very negative word. But uh, he, we, the, in Japan, the uh, inflation is a very, very positive uh, the, 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 uh, word. It's a kind of a long, uh, the uh, waiting uh, lovers to come, finally. <laughs> OK, looking at the fig figure, Development the CPI. Now we have uh, the, 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 the historically high level of uh, the uh, consumer price index, uh, which is uh, amounting to 4.2 percent. Historically high. Uh, this number we cannot, uh, we didn't, haven't seen for entire 30 years of time. So of course this is uh, the the, the uh, uh, brought about by the uh, cost increase cost of materials, importing prices. But anyway, we have a very high figure uh, on the consumer price index. So uh, the uh, important thing is, uh, what is going to happen from here? Whether this, uh, this rising trend of a price is a sustainable one, or it is just a temporary one, uh, and it's, a, it's just a one-shot uh, uh, happy story. But uh, we are now. Uh, very critical at the critical juncture to judge whether uh, this is a real fundamental change of the price and uh, uh, the, the uh, setting or, or change of the norm of economy. So uh, our outlook uh, indicated in the, the, the right hand side uh, have a 2.5 percent uh, increase for FI23, 1.9 for the FI24, uh, 1.6 uh, 25. So uh, as you may know, we have a so-called 2% inflation target. So unfortunately, still uh, in years of time, we are still below the 2% of a target. 
So that uh, indicates we, the uh, Bank of Japan, is not confident enough. The uh, current rise of inflation is going to be very uh, stable or sustainable. We have to see that the uh, further the uh, good uh, kind of uh, uh, dynamism, price and the wage uh, thing. So we are st still uh, a little bit, uh, cannot be uh, confident enough. So that is a particular reason why we are sticking to the uh, uh, ultra accommodative monetary policies. People are saying, now we have a 4.4% 4, 4 of an increase of CPI. Why don't you change your monetary policy stance? But as, uh, as we are not confident in, uh, uh, the, in, in, in the, the course of the time for, for the, the sustainability of the price level, uh, I, we think we still have some distance uh, from the, the uh, real policy change. But anyway, an important thing is that we have a high figure uh, whether it is a temporary structure, we have a high figure, and we have uh, some good sign of uh, price and wage dynamisms, which I'm going to, to, to talk uh, from now on. So, uh, in uh, having the, the uh, focus, uh, we are looking at the uh, price movement. Now, as I mentioned to you, the 4.2% uh, of the increase of CPIs are mainly uh, the cost by the increase of uh, the raw materials, the cost of raw materials, which is an uh, import, uh, reflected the import price. And looking at the, the, the uh, uh, right-hand side diagram, that indicates a kind of a pass-through of the increase of the import price to down to the uh, production process. So uh, stage one is uh, upstream of a production process. Stage four is a very, very downstream of a production uh, the, the, uh, the uh, process. So at the end of a production process, we still have uh, flattened uh, the, the uh, curve of uh, uh, price movement. So uh, how the pass-through from the uh, pr import price is going to be uh, materialized in uh, the, the uh, uh, final stage of a production and, all, uh, and uh, ultimately to the consumer price, uh, which is the key, key question. And the import, looking at that import price, it's a hit the peak already and now in the negative territory. So uh, uh, it may have uh, some negative impact of uh, future price uh, setting, but still there is a certain pass-through of the, the uh, past, uh, the uh, stage of uh, pass-through of the import prices to the uh, uh, downstream uh, uh, production uh, stage. And for the, uh, to estimate the, the inflation, another uh, uh, the, the big, uh, factor is uh, output gap. Uh, we are still in a negative territory of output gap. That means the uh, supply is uh, the, uh, the bigger than the, the demand. So that means if the output gap has an in a negative territory, that may have a downward pressure on the price uh, formulation. So now looking at the uh, situation here. Uh, it's negative, but it's very, very close to zero. So we are expecting those uh, the figure is going to turn to, 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 to positive in the coming months. And uh, so if the output gap is going to uh, go, go, it's turn to, to positive, then we have uh, some pressure from that side to the price setting. And looking at the inflation expectation, which is also another uh, the, the key factor for the, the inflation outlook. Uh, quite unfortunate, uh, the, the uh, uh, inflation expectation, uh, broadly speaking, is not anchored yet to the, our price two percent uh, uh, price target, two percent uh, price target. And but uh, the positive thing is, uh, it start to increase. So we have to look carefully uh, the, the uh, those uh, inflation expectation is going to uh, in the, the uh, uh, anchored in a, a two percent target, and. Uh, our uh, form, formation of our expectation in Japan is uh, quite adap adaptive. That means that people expect, uh, based on the, the actual number, the, uh, based on the history. So uh, currently now, inflation is uh, coming in, in town. So we have a very uh, high figure for the inflation, around the 3% 3, 3 point. That may have uh, some implication for the further formation of expectation. Uh, it may uh, come closer to 
And if it's going to, to stay around the 2% uh, the, the area, then we have to, to think about the change of our policy uh, stance, maybe. Uh, let me turn to, uh, he, we have a very huge hike of uh, the uh, consumer price uh, index, and uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, the, the uh, non-linear change in uh, the uh, behavior in, in, the, uh, in the economy. This indicates that the farm's price setting uh, stance. The, the uh, red line indicates the uh, ordinary uh, price setting. Uh, if the, the, the um, uh, higher, that means that they put the uh, higher price tag on, on their product. And if it is lower, uh, you put the uh, lower ta price tag. And looking at the blue line, which is very stagnant uh, over the, uh, the more than uh, 20 years' time, uh, this is a farm very, very cautious about the uh, changing output prices. So they never ever changed their price, uh, in regardless of their environment. Uh, why so? Uh, people think uh, the, uh, if, you raise the, if you alone raise your own price, you may have uh, some negative uh, the, uh, performance of your, uh, your, 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 your um, sales because uh, your competitor is stay uh, remaining at, at the same price level. So once you raise your price, you will lose the market. So that is a kind of a concern they have. So they keep, keep, uh, keep unchanged in terms of a price. So they, they, they are looking at each other, among others. So that, that kind of uh, the, the, the price setting practices end up with the very, very stagnant price level of Japan. And now it's a changing. Because of a huge cost push from the import, uh, they, have to, they don't have any alternative to raise the price. And they, if you look at your neighbors, Neighbor is in the same situation. They have to raise the price. So those kind of uh, uh, kind of the the, uh, the uh, neighboring effect. Now finally, you can uh, you have a certain confidence to raise your price. So that that is the uh, kind of uh, un, uh, the non-linear change of the price setting behavior in in, in Japan. And another graph indicate that. Uh, this is a price of uh, daily necessities, and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, light blue line indicates the uh, uh, goods in a very low uh, market concent concentration. That means the uh, competition is very high in, in this uh, market. So if a competition is very, very, uh, very um, uh, fierce, then uh, you, have, you are, uh, tend to stay in an uh, unchanged price. But now, finally, year 2023, uh, 20, uh, now it starts increasing. This is the, uh, uh, the phenomena we haven't seen for decades of time. So we can see the change of uh, the uh, uh, pricing uh, behavior. Okay. Then, uh, turn to the uh, wage. Uh, this is the, the uh, outcome of... Uh, our spring wage negotiation. We have an annual negotiation of the, the wage in springtime. Uh, and uh, uh, this year, we have a historically high outcome of uh, uh, wage negotiation, which come up to the 2.1% uh, of uh, base uh, payment and 3.6% uh, of a total wage. That's what's oh. here. So the difference of 1.5% is uh, it's a very unique feature in Japanese uh, wage setting. Uh, we are very famous for the lifetime employment, which is changing, but still we have a lifetime employment. And the payment is uh, based on the seniority. If you stay longer in your farm, your salary is automatically increased uh, year by year. So those kind of uh, automatic increases is, is uh, uh, is explained that the, the remaining portion of 1.5%, which is very unique. But anyway, uh, important thing is uh, finally we have uh, uh, the high figure for the base payment increase uh, during, uh, in, in this uh, 30 years time. And uh, another important thing is uh, looking at the right hand side, we have a widespread of uh, wage increase uh, in regardless of the size of the company and they are now increasing their wage. And uh, at the same time, even for the part-time employees, 
they have uh, also high figure for the, their own wage increase. So wage increase is now uh, in place, uh, at least uh, this year. So the real question is whether it is uh, sustainable or not. And looking back uh, history a little bit, here the development of the price and the wage, and uh, in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, this is very stagnant. The uh, wage and the price is uh, in a declining trend because uh, this is a percentage of an increase. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, around zero or even the negative number. And uh, more importantly, on the right-hand side, sensitivity between price and wage is very, very limited. Uh, in a year, between year 86, 95, we have a certain uh, sensitivity between the wage and the prices. But in uh, year 2000 to 2019, we have a very, very limited uh, the, uh, uh, sensitivity between them. Now, it is changing. Uh, this is the uh, rather technical thing, but the left hand side indicated, uh, the green line indicated uh, estimated uh, base pay increase. We have a certain uh, the way of uh, estimation of uh, uh, wage increase. But uh, uh, actual the, the increase of uh, green line and red line indicate uh, the uh, estimated uh, the, the base pay increase. So huge discrepancy between the estimation and the actual number. That means there is some uh, nonlinear change of, of uh, sensitivity from uh, CPI to wage. So CPI, one CPI increase have a more uh, the, the substantial impact to the wage increase. This is what is uh, uh, now happening. And what is in the background of the uh, wage increase? Uh, the important thing is the labor market condition in Japan. Uh, we are facing, too, the uh, labor uh, shortage. It is a more structural one. Uh, the uh, pandemic is uh, uh, one uh, other factor to contribute to the, the uh, labor shortage. But uh, the traditionally speaking, we have a relatively high figure of a labor sh uh, shortage before, prior to the pandemics. And uh, it is, uh, uh, again, the, the increasing trend. Then uh, that the short labor shortage is going to be uh, more likely to uh, more and more severe. It's going to be surpass the uh, situation in the bubble uh, economy era. So uh, labor shortage, uh, yes. And then uh, we have uh, some tendencies here uh, in the past. Labor, short, labor demand was uh, the, uh, matched by the labor supply by the seniors and women in Japan, which is uh, relatively uh, uh, the less participation in, in the market. Now we have a very stagnant uh, number here for, for the uh, senior labor participation uh, percentage. And uh, uh, the uh, bubble, uh, uh, sorry, baby boomer, uh, which contributed to the labor supply to a large extent is going to be the older than 75. Now, then it's going to be the grinding trend of a labor participation of those ages. For the women, uh, we have a very, very famous uh, uh, so-called M-shaped curve here. That means uh, if you have a plot the uh, labor participation uh, late uh, by ages, uh, the, in Japanese case, age 35 to 44, uh, the uh, labor participation rate is declined uh, to substan substantially because of uh, they are quite uh, busy for the domestic work, busy for the child raising, those kind of things. But now uh, yes, the situation is now changing. Looking at the number uh, uh, and the 35 to 44, that is uh, increasing a little by little, and that uh, M-shaped card is going to be uh, more, uh, comparing the yellow line, red line, it's going to be uh, flattened uh, to some extent. And more importantly, looking at the figure for the 25 to 34, uh, we have a higher number for uh, Japan. Oh, did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm not a sexually biased at all. So, <laughs> so anyway, looking at the, the figure for 25 to 34, we have a higher number than the US or Germany and uh, coming closer to the uh, Sweden case. So that indicates the uh, room for the increase of uh, labor participation in the female uh, uh, woman, uh, woman is uh, uh, some extent uh, somewhat less limited. 
So uh, that tells you the uh, labor shortage uh, uh, the situation in Japan is going to be more and more severe. So if those, uh, the labor shortage is severe, that may have uh, some uh, upward pressure for the uh, wage increase. Because the people have to, to recruit the good people, recruit the, uh, retain the good people. They have to, to, to offer them a higher wage. Uh, otherwise, they are going to move. But the move, then uh, we have another uh, important aspect of a labor market. That is a labor market uh, mobility in Japan. Now, the, the Kishida government is uh, uh, promoting uh, some policy to, to, to facilitate the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, laborers to move around the uh, working place. So they are a capable person can uh, seek for the higher price, higher wage. Uh, then uh, they, they can move from one company to another. We are, historically speaking, we have a lifetime employment, uh, which is a good uh, guarantee uh, for the people. But now, younger generation tend to do more uh, challenging uh, the, the, uh, in, in their behavior. They are hopping around, seeking for the uh, opportunity for the higher wages. So that may have another uh, the upward pressure for the wage setting. So all in all, uh, we are now uh, seeing uh, some kind of a break of a norm, of a so-called zero norm. Zero price increase, zero, uh, zero wage increase. That is changing. So the uh, norm is changing, but the real question is whether this is sustainable or not, and uh, whether this, is, uh, this time is different. And looking at uh, another uh, the important fact, uh, the indicator we have to see is uh, what happened to the uh, service prices. Uh, the, the, uh, looking at this is a kind of a histogram uh, of uh, the uh, CPI items. Looking at Japan's case, uh, we used to have a very high uh, concentration of a 0% increase in price. That is uh, the, uh, more, more, uh, the, the uh, more or less uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, deflected the service price uh, situation. Looking at the United States Euro area, when we have inflation right uh, this uh, uh, this timing, they, they, they are, their distribution is moving right-hand side. But in the case of Japan, we still have a, uh, the highest peak at, uh, standing at the 0%. So that means we, ha we still have a sti uh, the, uh, sticky, uh, stagnant uh, price in the services. And the last, last one is uh, looking at the uh, composition of the uh, price indexes. Uh, our case is a services uh, contribution is uh, quite limited uh, that compares with the United States case. United States, say, the uh, service prices increase is uh, the largest contributor to the, the uh, inflation. So the question is now wage increase, those increase in wage can be reflected in the service price setting or not. If we can see the, uh, some move uh, in the service prices, then we can uh, be more sure about the uh, price and the wage dynamisms. So coming months is a very, very critical month. We have to see what is going to happen. So um, I have a one slide to discuss the, uh, our broad perspective review, but I uh, leave it for our discussion. Maybe uh, the Rune has uh, many things to, to say about uh, her own the, the review. So I stop here. Thank you. Okay, so the, thank you very much, Kaizuka-san, for very insightful presentation about the details and the positive factors and the negative factor for the, for the inflation. Inflation is definitely the one of the important factors for the future of the Japanese economy. Shiro mentioned the exchange rate is really key. And exchange rate depends crucially on the inflation and its reaction to the central banks. Okay, so then we would like to have a presentation by Rune. Uh, okay, so floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Shiro, Ipe, and Llewellyn for inviting me to speak here today. And thank you for Mr. Kaizuka for uh, your keynote presentation. It was um, extremely interesting. Um, I don't work directly on Japan at the moment, but I did three chapters of my PhD on the effects of the Japanese economy on the Australian economy, so it's nice to um, revisit some of the issues that are facing um, Japan. And this week on Friday, I'm going to Tokyo, so I'm happy the exchange rate is low, so let's keep it that way. And um, we welcome, welcome any uh, restaurant recommendations um, that you might have along the way.
So it was good to see um, someone that's excited about inflation uh, in the world. Um, it's, it's always a positive somewhere, I guess. Um, so Japan is growing strongly, 6% growth, but it seems like a lot of that growth is coming from um, things like uh, net exports, and the risks seem to be on the foreign side as well. Um, things like the asset um, bubble in China, uh, and a lot of foreign factors driving growth. But it's good to see that there does seem to be some um, changes in the relationship between variables in uh, Japan in terms of um, changing um, in, in the price setting behavior of firms and things. So uh, maybe we're moving into a, a new era. So let me just, um, I want to just go over some of the slides. So as you know, I was one of the panelists on the review of the Reserve Bank of Australia. So, um, and it has been a long while since I talked about Japan. So I just wanted to um, explore a little more about what you're planning to do in um, the review. Uh, your, your broad-based review of Japan. And I stole this from uh, <laughs> Mr. Kozuka's slides, and luckily he didn't have time to go through it anyway, so this is a figure. <laughs> I was wondering, but I thought it would be okay this time. Um, so this is a graph of inflation, and uh, he has indicated um, the different periods of um, unconventional types of monetary policies that the Bank of Japan has adopted uh, from starting at the just after the financial crisis um, in 1997-98 in um, when, um, when interest rates were really like, at the zero lower bound in Japan. Um, now we're the first, first country to start to experiment with these policies that were unconventional. Um, so the Japanese case is a really um, interesting experiment for the rest of the world, maybe not an experiment for Japan, but um, it's given us a really sort of fertile uh, ground for policy research for other countries who are looking at what types of policies they might be able to use if they are in the case of being at the zero lower bound as well. So I just wanted to say I think it's a really great idea to conduct a review. Um, it's it's a, a good thing to reflect and to think about what types of monetary policy tools the bank might want to use in future downturns, now that they've got a whole suite of options that, that they've experimented with. And the rest of us can learn from um, that Japanese case as well. So my questions and, and comments for Mr. Kazuko come from the lessons of the review of the Reserve Bank that I've recently done in my reflections on that process. Um, so I'll just go through my slides and then uh, there's a lot in here, so um, we can see where, where you'd like to um, take the discussion afterwards in that panel context. But um, during the course of our review, we commissioned quite a few, uh, five academics um, to write on various aspects of monetary policy. And we had um, Professor Orfanides write something uh, for us on the unconventional policies that Australia adopted during um, the COVID period. And I've just taken some of his figures just to give you the international context um, of where uh, policy interest rates have been in a range of countries over the same period of time that we've seen Japan have their unconventional policies. So in the first um, figure we have um, the policy rates for the US, Europe, the Bank of Japan and the Swiss National Bank and we have um, Canada, Reserve Bank of New Zealand and the Reserve Bank of Australia in the second panel. So if we're looking at, um, you can see the, the Japanese uh, policy rate has been at the zero um, lower bound for a long period of time, uh, much longer than any other country. So you can see that um, big difference in, um, in, the, in uh, the, the types of monetary um, challenges that, that different countries are facing. Here, yeah, you'll see for Australia, we only uh, started to hit that zero lower bound uh, during the pandemic period in um, 2020. So just to give you a quick overview of the Reserve Bank of Australia review and then what the Bank of Japan is proposing, so just um, so we can give some um, comparison. So uh, last year in July 2020, the Treasurer announced a review into the RBA. In August, uh, we started working. We have a, had a panel of uh, uh, three people, Carolyn Wilkins from um, Bank of Canada, Bank of England, Princeton, and um, Gordon de Brouwer, the public, uh, Secretary for Public Sector Reform at that time. Um, and we had, to, we had all of this done, the whole report, by March 31st, we gave our report to the Treasurer. So he set us an objective of um, identifying how to make the uh, RBA the world's best and most effective central bank for the future. So that was our, our, our mandate and we had not very much time to do it. 
So this is the first um, independent and comprehensive review of the RBA. They hadn't done an internal review themselves. There had been reviews of different parts of the bank, like their research um, uh, models and things like that, but not of the whole uh, bank. So in the end, we made 51 recommendations. Um, and many of those recommendations came from um, our analysis of those periods, including the unconventional uh, policy periods uh, that, that we had. So I was trying to work out what the Bank of uh, Japan's um, broad perspective review is about. Um, there's not much uh, available at the moment in terms of information, uh, and I don't speak Japanese, so maybe that's why, but in terms of English language sources, um, the bank announced its review in April 2023, um, and that review was initiated by the bank of it itself, and, and that announcement came through their uh, monetary policy meeting. I mean, it's or announcements after, the, um, after they met. So the review period is from the late 1990s, um, I guess just around the time Ipe left, the, oh, started the bank, um, when, when they were dealing with the challenges of deflation and the challenges in achieving price stability. So the review is going to go over a period of one, and a, one to one and a half years. Um, and the main objective of the review are that they want to look at the positive and maybe some of the side effects, which I interpret as the negative effects, of some of the easing measures and how they should be understood um, in the context of what was happening in the Japanese economy, including uh, what was happening in the financial system, um, what was happening with the bursting of asset bubbles in the economy, what was happening with deregulation and globalisation uh, during that period, as well as the important demographic changes that we know um, Japan has been facing. So the, the idea is that, uh, that the bank wants to uh, deepen um, the understanding and insights for future policy conduct, which, which is what um, the RBA review uh, was about as well. So. So I, wanted, I have some questions in, in blue for Mr. Kazuka, um, which, which maybe some of them we can come back to later um, if you would like to. I, so I was just wanting, um, if you had a further elaboration on the terms of reference uh, for the uh, Bank of Japan's review. So our terms of reference were to look at the actual monetary policy framework that we have in Australia, including um, objectives and interactions with other major macroeconomic policies such as fiscal policy and macroprudential uh, policy. So um, we also we started by looking at the performance of the bank and then uh, the governance and the culture. So mainly the, the work we did on the performance informed most of the other recommendations that we made. So in this really short period of time, uh, we talked to 137 uh, people on, mainly on team calls because we had an international panel, so there was a lot of early mornings. We had lots of round tables. We surveyed uh, current and former bank um, um, employees. We had a couple of uh, public, well, one public event and one internal bank event. Uh, we had round tables <coughs> with academics. Uh, we <coughs> consulted with um, a lot of political parties uh, as well as crossbenchers, um, uh, the Liberal Party, the, the Greens, and I said something wrong as well, I guess. <laughs> and look, we had lots of international experts, and we, we, spoke, we talked to everybody. So I think that was a very um, good thing for us to do, because I think that um, one thing that people can't say about the review is that we didn't consult widely, and even people who don't agree, disagree, or who disagree with some of our recommendations have said, um, we don't agree, but thank you for um, consulting us, and we do feel that we have been heard. So I think that's a really important um, um, part of what we did. Our principles uh, for coming up with our uh, recommendations were how, how do we best position the RBA for an uncertain future? And we're doing this review in the context of after the pandemic, we've got climate change, we've got the supply shocks, we've got the war in Ukraine. So the future is, to us, seemed like it was going to be potentially very different to what we've seen in the past. So we always had that in our, our mind when we were coming up with our um, recommendations. So we wanted to ask ourselves, what can we learn from the past to keep the RBA and the monetary policy um, framework strong? And our guiding principles were that we wanted to build on the strengths. So um, we all had a lot of respect for what the Reserve Bank had, had done and you know, the, the framework that they had was um, very fit. Like the, the recommendations that we were making were uh, 
um, trying to build on what we already had. We didn't want to um, throw everything away. We wanted to ensure that the welfare of Australians was kept in mind. We wanted to build on the lessons that we've learned and we wanted um, our, our recommendations to be robust, clear, achievable, have public confidence, be flexible when needed, particularly when some objectives can conflict when we're dealing with complicated things like inflation and how that interacts with things like employment and growth. So I was just wondering what type, what, what are the principles underlying what your uh, review um, are going to be? So just to, I'll just give a brief um, review of what, uh, what we found and some of our, um, some of our, what our recommendations were. Um, We've, we found that uh, the framework has served Australia well. Um, the flexible inflation targeting framework has worked well in a period where we've had a lot of economic crises middle, um, coming globally. Um, and people understand what the inflation target is. They understand what the 2 to 3% uh, is. So during our consultations, we had um, some several periods where people wanted, I guess, answers to some of the questions they had about what was happening at the time. And those three periods were, we had a low inflation uh, period from 2016 to 2019. Uh, we had the pandemic period where we adopted uh, four of those additional types of monetary policy tools that Japan had been using themselves over their much longer history. And then we had the high inflation period um, afterwards when inflation bounced back higher than people anticipated. So the first period was that low inflation period. You can see a chart here of consumer price inflation and some unemployment on the right. So the period of concern is uh, from 2016 to 2019, where you can see that inflation is often below what the target was. People um, that we spoke to gave us a lot of different reasons of why we were below that target. Um, but there were some concerns as well because uh, the unemployment rate was higher than, than um, the bank thought that it could sustain given, um, it given, it given the circumstances at the time. So, so there's a question of why was unemployment higher than it needed to be when inflation was lower than it needed to be. Um, and we, there was a lot of confusion amongst um, RBA commentators and people thinking through this period uh, in that they all gave us different reasons for why this was the case. So we had things like um, the bank was concerned with financial stability. Um, they wanted to make sure they had some policy room uh, in reserve um, in case they needed to reduce interest rates dramatically in the future. So, um, some of these, these issues that um, were coming out of that was about um, communication and uh, having different um, strategies uh, already worked out um, for cases where um, the board could uh, look at different scenarios um, through time. So during um, the pandemic, we had uh, four different um, tools adopted. So. Uh, Australia adopted a yield curve target. So for those of you who don't know, the only two countries that have that had that type of policy is Japan um, and Australia. Uh, we implemented forward guidance. We had a term funding a facility as well as a bond um, purchase program. So the initial um, implementation of those uh, tools was a really important part of um, the economic response during the pandemic. Um, and the board and the RBA did uh, really well during that period of time uh, to keep the economy uh, going. But each of those tools had difficulties, especially at the uh, exit of some of those tools. And um, we learned quite a few lessons uh, from that, such as uh, making sure if, we're, if all of a sudden we're in a really complicated period and the board is looking using different types of instruments and tools that they haven't used before. So. Uh, and that interacted with financial markets in different ways. So, um, and, and the shocks that were hitting the economy were different to what we'd had before. So, um, it, it um, I guess, um, gave us some insights into what types of expertise we need on the board, what type of uh, board we need, how we can enable the board to get the information that they need in a way uh, that they can use. Um, 
in a timely manner, so to give them enough time to be able to um, fully understand the policies and um, risks and, and benefits and, and so on. Um, we're also, we also have recommended that um, we give more um, um, emphasis to uh, monetary policy strategy in terms of having exit strategies and understanding um, what will happen under different types of scenarios. So there wasn't too much of that happening um, before. And then we had the high inflation period, like everyone else, in 2022-2023, um, where inflation um, bounced up much quicker than people thought, and everyone else except for Japan, it seems, were a little unhappy about that. But some of the uh, lessons that we gained from that are um, we have to make sure that there's systematic systems in place to encourage uh, debate and challenge at the board, um, to give them different scenarios. So why, why didn't we consider a, 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 like a scenario that inflation did jump up uh, more quickly? Um, so so we've, we're just trying to put in place um, processes so that monetary policy can uh, adjust as quickly and as agile as as possible. Okay, so I guess um, our main our main lessons from all of those episodes were episodes combined were that we need clearly specified monetary policy objectives. Uh, we need to ensure constructive challenge and debate. Um, we need to make sure that we have a really good forecasting toolkits that um, maybe accommodate different types of uh, shocks and scenarios than we're used to seeing before. So. Now, all of a sudden, we have supply-side shocks, so are our models fit for purpose for that, for example? And, and how do we model fiscal policy now that we're using more of the unconventional tools? There's more relationship between monetary and uh, fiscal policy as well. Uh, we learned a lot about communication strategies and um, how important they are in communicating with the public and bringing the public along um, with them in terms of understanding uh, what's happening in the economy and what the implications of uh, decisions uh, might be. Um, so I was just wondering, Mr. Kaziko, if, if you have any early thoughts on the lessons um, that, that you might come out from your review, from your periods of unconventional policy, just some preliminary um, thoughts on that. I guess you've had this period of unconventional policy for so long. Um, it, it would be interesting to hear what, what your preliminary uh, thoughts are. All right, so I'm just going to go quickly through some of the recommendations, and I've highlighted in blue um, some of, I guess, some of the future risks or some of the some of the things that came to be important to us for Australia during the review, um, which I think are probably relevant for Japan as well, um, because they, the the lessons that we uh, learnt from looking at these policies actually had uh, broader implications for a lot of these other uh, types of areas. Um, so I guess I'm a little bit conscious of time, so I guess I will um, just focus on some of those, uh, um, those blue ones. So uh, one of the things that came out of our review was um, understanding how fiscal and monetary policy work and work together. So during unconventional times, the line can be blurred between what's a monetary policy decision and what's a fiscal policy um, uh, a type of decision. Um, so could some of these balance sheet policies that the bank have um, used, could they be better used uh, or targeted by fiscal policy? Because monetary and fiscal policy have different distributional um, effects. So how should we think about that? So um, we've recommended that uh, in the statement of the conduct of monetary policy between the Treasurer and the Reserve Bank Board that um, they settle some of those um, issues uh, in advance and we've also asked them to do some um, joint scenario analysis so that when we're in situations where monetary and fiscal policy really need to work together, how is that uh, best achieved across the whole economy? We've um, um, suggested regular reviews of the framework. so. This was the first review and it was a big deal because it was a first review. So um, the different types of shocks that are hitting the economy uh, may mean that the current framework we have uh, is not quite as appropriate as it has been in the past. And um, the Deputy Governor Michelle uh, Bullock of the RBA gave a talk just last week on climate change and um, monetary policy, 
at ANU and suggested that maybe this is something that they might need to look at in the future as our understanding of the types of new shocks that we are having uh, kind of evolves. We've also legislated the financial stability role. So there's, uh, during the low inflation period, there was um, some questions about why the RBA didn't change policy and some of that was because they were worried about financial stability of the banking system and the financial system. So that is not actually in the RBA's mandate. Um, that is an APRA responsibility, but our conclusion was that the RBA and APRA um, a need to really work together with the Council of Financial Regulators, um, but we also think that that should be in the legislation that the RBA has a responsibility for financial stability too. Um, climate risk is another thing that has come up a lot uh, through our discussions. Um, we made the recommendation that the bank don't directly address climate risk, so there were some suggestions that um, the Reserve Bank could direct banks to lend to climate uh, um, green types of industries and things like that. Um, we didn't take that into our um, into one, any of our recommendations, but we do think that the Reserve Bank has an important role in uh, facilitating that transition and making sure the financial system is uh, working as it should, um, given that um, in many ways central banks are the first responders to things like uh, climate shocks. Um, we've made recommendations based on what we learned from those episodes to uh, support deeper consideration of monetary policy um, deci decisions and strategy, um, as well as to strengthen transparency and accountability. Uh, we've also <coughs> recommended that in several instances that there needs to be a stronger role of research in formulating policy, particularly when we are in these different um, types of um, different types of um, eras. So I'm going to uh, finish up now. So I guess uh, my questions also are um, how, how forward-looking is a review? So you, you're looking backwards, but what are you going to do with the information that you, um, that you come out of that, um, in, especially in terms of things like in the new, new paradigm that we might be with supply shocks and uh, things like that. You also mentioned um, in the motivation, there were problems in the financial system, and I was kind of wondering about that. And I was also uh, wondering about the long time frame for the review. So you have a long time to do this, but um, at the same time, you're um, dealing with your yield curve control um, issues. And I was just wondering, does this review mean that uh, your, um, you might change your exit types of strategies given um, that review? Um, and you, there was no consideration of, of culture and governance and things in it. So obviously it's a very different review, but these are some of uh, my reflections. But um, in the paper that we had commissioned uh, by Professor Alfonides, he had looked at our policies, but he also looked a lot at the policies of Japan. And one of the uh, comments that he had uh, in his paper, which you should read, it's a, a great paper, um, was a reflection from your current governor, Ueda, that he wrote in 2000 when he was, he was obviously not governor then, uh, but he wrote in the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking, which is a highly esteemed um, economics journal, that uh, do not put yourself in the position of, of zero interest rates. I tell you, it will be more painful than you can possibly imagine. So it's interesting now that um, you know, 13 years later, or no, 23 years later, he's finally getting to do um, this review to look at some of those issues. So I'm sorry I've gone a little bit um, on a little bit, but um, so thank you for listening. Listen. Thank you.